Welcome to the next installment of the Analytics at Wharton series focused on artificial intelligence. I'm Eric Bradlow, Professor of Marketing and Statistics here at the Wharton School, and I'm also Vice Dean of Analytics at Wharton. We think one of the important applications and areas that we as a business school should focus on is what we're calling today's session, AI in Action. And I can think of no two better people to speak to us about this than number one, my colleague, Bob Meyer, who will be joining us. Bob is the Frederick H. Ecker MetLife Insurance Professor. He's also the co-director of the Wharton Impact of Technology Initiative. So first, Bob, uh, welcome to our podcast. Welcome. It's good. Good to be here. And then second um, is Mr. Roger Gu. Uh, Roger is the co-founder and president of Wachai, a prominent independent mobile-based platform for comprehensive wealth management in China. Uh, Roger's got a career spanning multiple decades, both in the United States and in China. He also serves, and I'm very proud to have Roger both as a friend, but as a valued member of the Analytics at Wharton Advisory Board. So, Roger, welcome to our podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Pleasure. So, Bob, let me start with you. Um, you do a lot of work on the impact of technology, let's call it broadly defined, on human behavior. So could you all, and of course, employees are humans too. So could you talk about, in your perspective, some interesting, let's say, uses of artificial intelligence today in companies, either by employees themselves or by firms, and kind of the impact that you think it's having? Uh, well, in, in many respects, uh, you know, when when did it all start or how long have we been using it? And and I think it, you actually have to go back to through decades where basically different kinds of artificial intelligence have basically been an integral part of companies forever. I, I remember, I, I like to say I was on the ground floor uh, when I first started my career. I was at Carnegie Mellon University and I used to play poker with some people from the computer science department. And one of their complaints was that they had to go walk all the way down the hallway Way to get find out what was in the Coke machine because they would go down there and find out it was empty. So basically, they they pr they programmed one of the very first uh, uses of FRID technology to to program uh, their uh, the Coke machine so they could sit at their computers and find out where uh, uh, what, whether it was empty or not it was worth the trip. And so of course today there's you know how many in internet connected devices there are is like you know three times the world's population. So it's basically been integrated throughout every single single function of a business, particularly in manufacturing, consumer use, and so forth and so forth. Um, and so I, I think some of the things that are happening today is we're shifting from uh, artificial intelligence as a way of looking up information, processing data, to actually generating new knowledge. And um, uh, and that's sort of like, for and so one of the challenges, I think, for a lot of employees, if you're, say, in advertising, am I no longer going to be needed to generate um, advertising copy when I can just throw it into ChatGPT and it will generate the advertising? So. Yeah, I think one of the big areas that we've talked about on this series is what I say, and we, I agree, AI's been around for a long time, as I was a PhD student almost 30 years ago, is that predictive AI and the use of AI to as, as a data source, whether it's computer vision, sound, et cetera, that's been around. As you pointed out, it's the generative AI part that's got people really right, excited right. today. So, Roger, you actually have a company, an actual company, which I, that does work in this area. So could you elaborate on some specific areas where your, where your organization is implementing AI today? Yeah, sure. Yeah, initially, we also started with, like you said, in predictive AI, because, you know, our platform, people park their financial accounts information, like their bank accounts, credit cards. Uh, insurance, retirement plans. So we have a lot of called structured data. So we would use the data to improve our user experience and also help help our partners to sell their products. But as time moves out, you know, we got unstructured data like a voice, uh, image, as you mentioned. And in the last few years, it is the uh, generative AI that came along. It's quite interesting. We launched a uh, business called Online Financial Literacy Program about three years ago, when people were locked down during the uh, COVID period, when this live streaming e-commerce went on like crazy. You know? So we launched this uh, online financial literacy, and so far we have about 3 million people paid for our uh, wealth management courses. And it's very interesting. Uh, the large language model and the GPT-3, I think they emerged about two years ago. 
And we took notice. It's not until last November when this chat GPT, GPT 3.5 came along, it hit us at the right time because back then we were hitting the right bottleneck of time. We cannot hire our teaching assistants fast enough and train them fast enough. Then we turn on to the models. You know, uh, generative AI helped quite a bit. One, it is the uh, kind of help enhance the interactions by doing it more customized, more uh, kind of uh, deeper and far reaching with automatic content generation. So we developed in uh, Robo TA, and what it does is uh, this traditional kind of instruction exercise quiz cycle. It tagged along with each individual student. And when the test is done, and it went down to tell the people that, you know, what you did wrong and help them to review the content. The content is tailor-made individually on each knowledge point that they have missed. So this PowerPoint is generated on the spot and the people can do it interactively until they click the I understand button. So it's been very helpful. And also we have daily financial news kind of analysis program. And today, I think more than 90% of the content is generated by this uh, uh, large language model, generative AI. Our research analysts only need to do a very brief review and then click on the publish button. So it does help us quite a lot. I think over 80% of interactions are performed by AI today rather than human being. So Bob, could you talk, uh, given, you know, the center you you run now, well, you're one of the co-directors of AI at Wharton, um, but it was also the Wharton Impact of Technology Initiative. Um, how do humans, whether it's learners, as in the case Roger was talking about, employees, respondents in studies, how do they tend to respond when they know something? Maybe they know, we'll get to Roger, back to Roger in a second, whether they know it's generated by uh, an AI engine, how do consumers tend to respond to the difference between the two? Yeah, that's very interesting. There's been an uh, increasing amount of work naturally on that. I think one of the challenges, of course, right now, there was a time when uh, you, you, you could tell whether or not something was, you were interacting, for example, in a, a text interaction with a service person where you knew you were dealing with a robot and people didn't like that, okay? Whereas now, it's very, very difficult to tell. And sort of one of the issues in uh, in like online advertising is deep fakes where basically you cannot tell the difference between it. And so that sort of represents sort of an ethical issue. And certainly, as you might expect, people don't like it when they think that they're being fooled. And so that there's some evidence of that. Uh, another area that we're looking into, uh, I have a colleague that's looking into, is one of the things that the generative AI is doing is that it's synthesizing information and offering summaries and advice in task domains where you used to do it manually. So for example, um, if you needed to know something about a topic, you would go to Google and you would go through bunches of sites and you were left to do the synthesis yourself and form your own conclusion. Now you could just go to, whether it's Bing or ChatGPT, ask a question, um, you know, how do you do this? What's your best advice for this? And it'll take, it will eventually do all that work for you, synthesize it and give you an answer. And what we're finding, and it's, it's sort of early in the process, but basically people don't necessarily like that all that much. In some sense, it's a, it's a thing where you feel that you have less ownership over it. And so right now, one of the biggest outstanding question is how much intelligence do people want? Okay, and the, the reality is, is I, I guess just the same way that you don't necessarily, um, you know, want to order all your meals out. Sometimes you want to cook them yourself. In a lot of cases, it could be there are going to be some domain where people are going to be more trusting and feel more ownership if they're gathering the information themselves rather than having a computer do it, even if it's the case that the computer uh, advice is actually maybe a little bit better. So, Roger, the, uh, Bob's response is a perfect segue to my next question to you. Um, as the president of a large company that's impacting millions of not only learners, but also investors, people doing their private wealth management, how do you decide what to kind of assign to the, an AI engine, whether it's an AI chatbot or an AI automatic grader or an AI person that gives or an AI engine that gives feedback? And what do you leave to humans? Is it purely one of scale? Is it one of finance? H how do you think about what to assign to whom? 
Oh, I think it's a, in practice, it's an emerging process. It's a grayscale kind of segmentation. And we do have a lot of content uh, generated by AI. And the people would know it's AI. For example, it's a Q&A session when they ask general question or AI ask question, they answer. They know they are dealing with AI. Uh, that's kind of uh, level level one. But level two, we have uh, uh, people People would think they are interacting with a live person, but actually this live person is largely assisted by the AI. Uh, for, the, for example, a piece of news analysis. Uh, actually, our research analysts are not that powerful of gathering so much information on time. You know, they are really empowered by the AI and, and the highest level. And we have people kind of upgrade to the ultimate level. They become a, a member. They pay the membership fee for our advisory services. And they would appreciate uh, not only the assistance with AI, so uh, it definitely helps a lot, but I don't think at this stage, you know, AI can completely replace human being even for everything. You know, I'm the Elon. Uh, I have three brothers million followers, and my company tried to build a digital version of uh, Rive, and it didn't do that well. I don't like it yet, so I still try to sort of publish my villa uh, in person. So I think it's uh, it's a process, emerging, ongoing. But you know, looking back in less than a year, it has made tremendous progress. Yeah, so Bob, um, building on Roger's point and the point you made earlier, how do you see, you know, we always try to say it's not humans or AI, it's humans and AI. How do you see that partnership evolving? And also do, you know, you can imagine if I was an employee and I was being strategic, if in some sense I prove to the company that AI can replace me, that may not be great either. So how do you see those two interacting? Well, I think Roger is spot on in saying that the real challenge is, is how do you figure what's their optimal blend? Like, well, what are the things? And uh, we recently, in the um, um, a couple months ago, we ran a uh, generative AI conference out in San Francisco, and uh, some of the, one of the big topics there was to trying to figure out uh, such, uh, how good is be the best generative AI in generating creative solve uh, solutions to problems. And um, and it seems to be the case that the the emerging consensus is that what it does do is um, if if people if you let uh, uh, say ChatGPT work on a creative solution to a problem, what it does is it, it's much better at bringing up the low end of, of human ability. So basically, if people who are not creative, not good problem solvers, you definitely want the machine stepping in because they do a much better job. On the other hand, what it does do is it tends to um, uh, make solutions seem very similar that it comes up with. And basically, there's the high end tail of people who, or there are people who are particularly skilled at problem solving. And, uh, and in that case, what will happen is you'll compare the, the best of the human judgments, and those tend to be better as judged by outside people uh, than, than ChatGPT solutions. So, so the task is, is that, that you, I think, consistent with what Roger was talking about, um, you want to identify people within the organization who really do have these very special creativity skills and so forth, and you want to let them free, you know, and maybe work, work you know, with tools, but basically you don't want to replace that. It's actually an interesting theory, which I'm sure people will test over time, which is does this if you'd like, AI engine actually inhibit creativity on the part of the humans. It's why I always say, you know, the last thing, I always tell this to PhD students, and then, I'll, Roger, I have another question for you. The last thing I do when I try to come up with a creative idea is want to read someone else's paper or synopsis paper because it does not help me come up with a creative idea at all. Um, so, Roger, let me ask you, um, robo-advisory services seems maybe to me a much higher stakes type of decision than someone trying to learn financial literacy. So how do you think, I'll just use the language that we use in academia all the time, there's a very different loss function between an AI engine making some portfolio allocation or recommendation to me and then I go bankrupt as a result, or you know, I take some sort of literacy test and the AI engine kind of gets it wrong and I'm like, all right, well, that's not great, but it's not the end of the world. How do you think about, Bob was talking about, let's call it employee heterogeneity, how do you think about task importance heterogeneity and the role of AI given high stakes versus low stakes types of decisions? 
well, this is a very important question. You know, uh, I take the robot advisory as a high stake. Uh, it's interesting. This uh, this uh, this new phenomenon called generative AI tend to be sometimes very creative, especially GPT. You know, sometimes it's imaginary. Uh, well, Llama two it tends to be more specific. So in this uh, robot advisory, it has two sides of equation. Uh, one side is the customer profiling customer. The other side are the asset understanding, asset char characteristics. So on the right hand side, asset characteristics, we want to be very careful with. In terms of AI, it's still the classical AI. You know, classical uh, statistics, uh, partial differential equation. Uh, some sort of uh, recursive neural network, just understand uh, understand the sigmas, the, 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 the betas, uh, the gammas, you know, make sure that part, the efficiency frontier, are still out there. But the left-hand side, the customer needs, uh, the, the life, you know, uh, objectives can be very, can be very suggestive because in the past, the classical way, uh, doing this sort uh, of advisory services is used to ask people about, you know, your personal asset, liability, income, how many kids you have, when are they going to school, when I want to retire, then come up with tailor-made solutions. But now with generative AI, this can go a lot deeper. Uh, you can have conversations about life objectives. One is, of course, retirement. You also have, for example, a wedding anniversary. But then in the, 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 the advisory for a wedding anniversary, the risk profile appetite could be very different from a kind of 20-year retirement plan. So for wedding anniversary, if you take on risk, like play with derivatives or leverage trading, if it works well, you know, you go on skiing in Switzerland. If it does not work, you always have, you know, uh, Disneyland in Florida. So I think with the help of AI, this can go a lot deeper a lot more creative, interactive, and, and also gamifying-ish. Meanwhile, still holds the seriousness of uh, financial advisory. So I think it definitely adds value. You need to understand where to use them kind of uh, correctly in the, in the prudent fashion. Yeah. Um, Roger, I have a question for you. Uh, uh, do you ever worry a little bit that as, um, particularly in the context of financial advising, that the uh, the tool becomes so good that people maybe put too much trust in it. Um, so, for example, if you're dealing with a human advisor, you know you're dealing with a human, and you know that humans are, fa are are fallible. And so, if the human advisor basically tells you this is what you should be doing with your money, this is what you should be for retirement, you'll follow that advice, but basically with uh, um, but you know it's potentially somewhat fallible. But on the other hand, if if you have a uh, a very advanced uh, um, computer tool, which is, uh, and you, you sell it as being, you know, optimized based on whatever, uh, is there a worry that people would become then go the other extreme of being too trusting of it? Well, Bob, I'm not worried about this part. Actually, people believe what they believe. Uh, they can believe a, a real person. They can believe into an algorithm, which is also humanized, have content generation. If the results are good and they believe into it. So the beauty here is you don't have one uh, key opinion leader. You have dozens, you know, because even right. different AI have different right. characteristics. And people yeah. have my value based yeah. and my growth based. So, and, and it's fun. What I do worry is actually on the regulatory pieces because, you know, generated AI, like I said before, tend to be more creative. So, but there are rules and regulations what you can say, what you cannot say. For example, uh, with certain uh, kind of uh, licenses, you're not allowed to recommend individual stocks. Or maybe you are not allowed to recommend something to people not at this risk rate. So this part, you got to be very careful. If you ever cross the line, it is actually the companies, the people behind those, uh, this AI are holding uh, are held responsible. So I want to be very careful about that. But unfortunately, uh, the lines are not very clear given from the regulators because it's a new thing for them as well. So, Bob, you and I are both obviously marketing professors. Um, you had mentioned about, let's call it 
ad creation is one area. What do you see? And then I'm going to ask Roger about his area in fintech. But what do you see as the major application areas that you see, not just us as academics studying, but that you see AI is going to be used in our home field of marketing? Well, I think you had mentioned the case of uh, usually when people say, well, how, there's two different cases of it. Okay, certainly sort of predictive AI that's been around forever and product design and so forth. Um, uh, and, and certainly in the case of every time you go to Amazon, you're seeing AI. Okay, you're basically seeing products recommended for you. And that's been around for, 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 for a while. And so presumably, they'll see improvements on that. You're going to be seeing... Um, uh, b better customizations. And when you go there, you go, whoa, how did it know that's exactly what I wanted? And some people might find that scary, but other people might find that's exactly sort of the product I want. Uh, the other side, in terms of the creativity part, that's sort of uh, a little bit we don't quite know yet um, in terms of whether or not if we effectively uh, fully turn over all of um, the creative process and advertising design, creative process and strategy formulation, uh, pot the potential is certainly there, for example, with uh, large language models and gener generative AI at whole to basically generate all of this. Now, whether or not that's, that's end up going to be the type of thing which is going to generate uh, that out-of-the-box type of ad campaign, which really makes the difference for a company, as opposed to whether or not it makes it generates a whole bunch of advertising, which is all the same. Okay, so effectively, it's just sort of you know it's covering the mass rather than the tail. And usually, we like to focus more on that. that breakthrough creative idea and I'm not so sure they've converted very much out whether or not um, generative AI can produce that kind of a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And Roger how about in fintech what do you see as the biggest uses of AI today? Well I we'll just follow on what you guys were discussing about in marketing I think uh, I'm actually very optimistic just like help to discover new you know DNA patterns new drugs and also in AlphaGo, you know, AI discovered new ways of playing Go. And in this marketing, especially in the fintech area, every month we spend the tens of millions uh, into those, the, we call it, you know, uh, uh, information on, on TikTok uh, uh, or equivalent to kind of Google app kind of uh, on, on those sites. So every week or every point of time, usually we have hands at the we call the marketing plan go now. And which ones are gonna stick, you don't know. But with generative AI, you can create those creatives uh, very easily. It's like it dispersed different patterns to track the winners, figure out the DNAs from those marketing plans. Maybe it is, you know, the way you bring up a a pet versus a young boy. You know, maybe it is the feeling of a retirement age, something like that. But the underlying, I call DNAs of marketing materials, now can be sort of tried and iterated and discovered very well. And in this whole space of digital bar, I think it takes to the next level. So I think that's on the one hand, because every company needs to acquire customers and manage customer experience. I think AI could help a lot. Uh, I think what furthermore, because this chat GPT, uh, this generative AI, a large language model, usually it's not as good as sort of doing new numerical calculations. But now with this plugins, you can actually combine you know, those tools with the traditional AI. And actually even on the asset management side, I can see uh, new kind of AI powered kind of trading algorithms, very different from the traditional ones, and competing uh, on par with the uh, uh, the kind of traditional uh, hedge funds uh, programs. So I think uh, it's a big thing. It's coming, and only we, we're right now only scratching the surface. So we only have about a minute left. So Bob, maybe in 30 seconds or so, um, if we're sitting here 10 years from now, what have we been talking about? What are we going to be talking about that's happened over the last 10 years? 
that's an awesome question. I have no idea whatsoever, and and I think that in it, it's it's in, from my perspective as a researcher, this is like uh, the most exciting time to be alive because basically what we're in the precipice of is just really very fundamental transformations as to uh, how people get information, how people generate information, and we're just beginning to understand how this is affecting society. And so, to me, there's just so much to, that we have to learn as researchers going forward. So it's an awesome time to be here. And Roger, from your point of view, um, how do you think about the business world, investing? What do you think are going to be the big breakthrough issues in AI in the next few years? Well, I think companies have to figure out their position in this big AI game. You know, it's like a big tree, right? You have OpenAI, Google, those guys are the roots, right? And you have maybe uh, fintech players like us. They are the sort of industry specific applications. They are like trunks. And there are many, many leaf applications. So I think uh, either you are a, a young entrepreneur right into the game or whether you are an established company, I think it's very important to understand the financial, uh, the technology trends and the figuring out your position in your field. I think you know, keeping an open mind would be very, very helpful. And uh, things change and we got to adapt. Well, this is Eric Bradlow, Professor of Marketing and Statistics here at the Wharton School and also Vice Dean of Analytics. I'd like to thank my two guests, my colleague and friend, Bob Meyer, the Frederick H. Ecker MetLife Insurance Professor and also one of our co-directors of our Center on Artificial Intelligence in Wharton. And I'd also like to thank Roger Gu, who's the co-founder and president of Achai, a prominent independent mobile-based platform for personal wealth management in China. And as I also mentioned, one of our valued board members at Analytics at Wharton. So Bob and Roger, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.